Thank you very much, and um, I'd like to add my, uh, my support to the uh, acknowledgement that we are meeting this morning on the traditional lands of Aboriginal people and to express my appreciation for the fact that our connection with Aboriginal Australia connects us to the oldest known surviving human culture, something we should be always proud of. Um, the, the second um, thing I have to say is that the title um, which I'm speaking to you under is How We Won the NDIS. Um, I think that's probably a bit boastful in its description of my contribution. So that's probably what I'm going to try to do. I don't know how, um, how, how I can make that sound sufficiently modest and useful. But secondly, the way I decided I should present this is in more or less those terms. So in other words, I'm not going to try to be didactic about what should be done by you about the things that are important for you to campaign on. Um, I have my views and they're supportive, but I'll just talk about what I know about and not try to tell you how to suck eggs, as the saying goes. So when we started the campaign, the first thing that we did with the people that were the activists, and it was a significantly smaller group than, than this, I might say, um, was, was to decide how we would define victory. So when you think about it, every campaign campaign is a concept borrowed from you know, military matters, and you know, in military affairs, people decide what victory is. Um, you know, taking hills, invading borders, whatever. Um, in a campaign, we decided that victory was uh, attracting sufficient public support for the National Disability Insurance Scheme to be legislated for, popularly supported and funded, um, all those things seeming to be parts of the same uh, machine. So that was the first thing, and I think that's something that's always very important in campaigns, to actually know what it is you're trying to do. Um, seems like a, a funny statement, but a, a lot of times defining victory can be quite difficult and it also is a unifying factor. It also provides for solidarity as people sort through what they think victory actually means. Second characteristic of our campaign, um, and anybody who observed it would probably be very familiar with this and possibly to the point of ad nauseum, was that it expressed itself always in a simple a simple binary form, which was a problem and a solution. So the big problem was that Australia had one of the worst disability support systems um, for of any of what used to be called, out of poor respect for geography, Western societies or OECD um, um, jurisdictions, and we should have the best. Um, that was the problem and the solution was the NDIS. Uh, and so I suppose that was the macro campaign, but everything we talked about, whether it was an individual's problem about not being able to get a wheelchair or having to wait nine months uh, for valuable therapy for a, a child that needed, um, uh, needed therapy for a disability or, or any of the other kinds of micro problems and the intermediate problems of, of state jurisdictions being, being unable to meet waiting lists for respite, all of those things were always couched in that simple binary way. There's a problem and there's a solution. So that was, that was kind of a very simple way, um, but we were fairly simple people. And I think campaigning sometimes becomes very complicated, um, but one of the art, one, one of the, I think the most important things is to keep it as simple as you possibly can. Our campaign was about everybody else. So one of the things that was traditional in disability I don't think it's quite the same in, in environmental uh, campaigning, but it's, it's, it's a bit common, I think, to everybody that goes around campaigning for something, is that the campaign is not about you. The campaign is about everybody else. It's particularly graphic in the case of disability because some of you probably, un, probably have some knowledge of the idea of the social model of disability, which is to say, forget about wheelchairs or forget about limitations and amputations and... Um, cognitive issues, just to focus on the fact that people with a disability have so many restrictions placed in their lives by virtue of the way they're perceived and by virtue of the way they're forced to behave or the situations they're forced into by the external forces of society. So it was easy for us to make the leap that disability isn't about people with a disability, disability is about everybody else. Um, and 
Therefore, the politics of disability needed to be about everybody else, needed to be about changing everybody else's view uh, about, uh, about disability and about how um, disability support should be managed, um, not, in fact, talking to ourselves, um, because we already knew about it, uh, and so did most of our supporters. So that was, I think, another kind of thing that became very important in our campaign success. Um, the other thing we did was we um, very, very uh, nakedly and somewhat, um, uh, I suppose, well, we're not worrying too much about um, being a little bit hokey about it, we nakedly borrowed uh, from the vocabulary of popular values. So we didn't have a restriction on our own set of values. In fact, you know, like every field of human endeavour, especially political and endeavour, um, disability has this uh, an annoying range, if you're an external, per if you're an outsider, this annoying range of insider jargon, most of which has quite imprecise meanings anyway, but, um, but this insider jargon sort of excludes everybody else from being able to participate in the discussions. Um, but also what it does is it creates a set of values which are just internal to that group of people. Um, and so we kind of picked two values which, um, which became very important to us as, as, cam as campaigning values, but also became very useful in, in applying different elements of communication to these two values. And one of them was regarded really as quite insane on my part. Um, and indeed, I could have been the, 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 uh, the shortest serving national campaign director of any campaign because I, I fronted a group of people like this in the disability sector, advocates, um, service providers and, and, uh, and carers and, and care or care of peak groups and told them that what we had to do was launch our campaign on Australia Day and we had to talk about the patriotic reasons for supporting a new disability system. And I think they thought I was nuts um, or it had some sort of breakdown. But no, um, well, maybe I had had that, all that. That might have been true. But, but, the, but the, the key thing was that this was an important part of, of the way we built our campaign. Because we went from that to part of... Now, don't, don't get too upset with me about me saying this, but it is a part of the, of the self-legend um, of... Um, broad Australian values, that people believe that Australia is a country that stands for fairness and the fundamental Australian value is that of a fair go, and all the sort of, all those sorts of things that people have inherently and deep down in their psyche, um, it's condition, or I don't need the argument about where it all comes from and how it's untrue or whether it is true or, or any of the other kinds of things, but nonetheless, the idea of a fair go and fairness when applied, when applied to patriot, patriotism, because they're in the Australian context one and the same thing, or nearly one and the same thing, or so closely aligned as to be near enough to being the same thing, they become a very potent motivator of people who weren't interested in disability. That is to say, it was the use of a kind of um, what, it, what, what has become a kind of um, fairly annoying characteristic of of politics of defining people as inside or outside of the circle of people that could be regarded as real Australians. Um, um, but I think we did, it, did this in a fairly constructive and value positive way. Um, the, other, the other thing that we made all the activists do, and I suppose we shouldn't say we made them, we didn't coerce them into doing it, but we decided that was a, a good thing, was that everybody had to have their own stump speech. We insisted on that. And a stump speech is, is literally comes from you know, the usage of American politics where everybody has a personal reason for why they support what they think should happen. And it's based on a personal story about what you do and, and why, um, why you think it's important to have um, a better disability system or why you think it's important to have a 100% renewable target or any of the other kinds of important things. But it needs to be personal. It needs to be... Um, a stump speech for activists because what people will listen to nowadays, and I think maybe they always did, but I think it's become more important than ever, is an authentic voice. There's no, there's no, while it's very useful to be informed by research and focus groups and all the other things we do, um, what people really want to hear, I think, is an authentic voice about what's, what's, what's going on and why something needs to be pursued. And so that's why in all of our media, 
all of our uh, testimonial work, everything we did on in, in, in real events, real-time events, everything we did on social media, we picked real people. We didn't have lobbyists, we didn't have national campaign coordinators, we didn't have the professional people talking about it. Um, we had always the people that were actually either providing the services or, in more importantly, people who would use the services, people with a disability themselves, <laughs> or their carers or people that um, were relevant and had relevant experience and had an authentic reason um, for describing that problem and that solution. In terms of lobbying, I think I need to talk about this a bit um, in the panel session, but, um, but just very quickly, you know, um, one of the kind of things we did, and I think it is one of the reasons why the campaign was very successful, is, is we, we pursue really came from my wife, actually, who, who said to me one day, who'd been a member of the... had, was at the time, a member of the parliament, and, and, um, and I'd been in the parliament, and, and, it, and this is a truism, that if you're in parliament, you get very used to the fact that everybody hates you. <laughs> and you get very used to the fact that you can't please... It used to be you can't please anybody, you know, can't please all the people all the time. In fact, you can't please anyone most of the time. And so, and so you get very used to sort of these meetings where people come and they tell you all the things that are wrong and you <laughs> smile nicely, offer them a cup of tea and say you'll look into it or you'll do something about it or make some concession which they think is no good and so on. So that's, that's the life of a lot, especially in marginal seats where the idea of campaigning against marginal seat members has now become de jure. And so, um, so well, I think the key thing that we did was we said well, we want you to be our champion. We didn't go into their office and say, you're a bastard, we hate you, you don't support a good disability system, you're presiding over the world's worst disability system. We said, no, look, we, we, we think we've got the idea that's a solution to this problem. Will you be a champion for your people locally who want this to happen? And it was amazing. They all kind of responded, everybody except Joe Hockey. And the, and the, and the, only, other thing, and the only other thing we did is we always made sure, and everybody knows this one now, it's kind of become standard, but um, we made sure everybody posed for a selfie with the person with a disability went in, so I didn't go and see them, lobbyists didn't go and see them, none of our professional people went to see them. <laughs> we had people, we had training sessions and lots of work in informing people how to go and do it themselves and explain to them, to explain to people in Parliament, make an appointment as a local constituent and say, this is what I want, and then get a picture of them saying, you know, we support National disability issues, you know, all the various our little sub um, sub icons. But the bottom line is that we then put them all on the gallery, on the website, and it took the political parties about a month and a half before they worked out what we were doing, which is that <laughs> we had two thirds of both sides of or all the sides of parliament on the website with signs supporting our campaign. So in a parliament where there was only one seat difference. Um, uh, between government and opposition. So I think that's probably um, the most important things I have to say. There's a couple of other things that, um, that I'll say very, very quickly in, in winding up, which is that if you're going to use social media, you need to make it real. That was a, a big lesson for me was social media because I was a complete dinosaur and so lots of people taught me how to use it in a campaign. But on the other hand, you know, we kind of really got to the idea of how we made it real by coordinating it with real campaign events and, and by making sure that their voices that we were using were always authentic. You need to pursue, and I don't know if you need to pursue it, but we, because of, because of the big numbers that are being dealt with, because of the big changes that are being dealt with, I think it's pretty similar, you have to have bipartisan stroke multipartisan. So you've got the Greens and Independents and other people, so it has to be multipartisan these days, same thing. You need to kind of get a set of lines which work for everybody, um, uh, if you can. And it's not easy. Um, and and the only other the only other point, and I'll conclude on this, which is, which is, that I said we just sort of defined victory, and we defined victory by getting the NDIS through the parliament. You got the then prime minister there at one of our campaign meetings, where she basically announced the the, the kind of transition to a, a parliamentary basis of the campaign, i.e. legislating for it. And, and one of the things that we avoided in the campaign, and I noticed no one avoids it in environmental campaigning these days, everybody's very economic, but um, we avoided it like the plague, and that was how we were going to pay for the NDIS. And so we kind of kept on saying, well, that's really a problem for government because, you know, they're the people that work all that stuff out. We're just working out what's a good policy. And we got away with that remarkably for about three and a half years until, <laughs> until, until one 
really frightening day, Tony Abbott stood up in the parliament and dared Julia Gillard to announce an increase in the Medicare levy to pay for the NDIS. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, Julia, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And, of course, a day or two later, Julia got up in the parliament and said, yes, here's a prime ministerial statement. I'm going to introduce next week a, um, a bill to increase the Medicare levy to pay for the NDIS. I thought, oh, God, this is the end. You know, we're ruined. And, and, and because I knew that weekend was a news poll round, so I knew news poll would put a question about the NDIS in a news poll that weekend and it'd be published on Tuesday and the campaign would be over. Um, because we knew from three years before that only about 18% of people support an increase in the Medicare levy for the NDIS. And so, with trepidation, I went out on Tuesday morning to get the Australian um, from my driveway when it hit the pavement at about 4.30 in the morning, unwrapped it nervously with a cup of coffee, and then was amazed to find that 73% um, of Australians supported the increase in the Medicare levy to pay for the NDIS. And two things happened. I realised the campaign had actually worked. <laughs> and secondly, I, I fell in love with the idea of Australia as a place where you know, fairness is is real, after all. And not only that, um, it proved one other terrible point, which I hate to say this, it's a, it's a crude thing, but um, I said that we got the MPs on side by you know, being nice to them instead of nasty to them. Um, but you know, I realised that when you talk about an opinion poll which says that people are, you know, nearly 80% of people are happy to pay higher taxes for something, that it proves the old case of Richard Nixon, which is, if you've got them by the balls, their heights and minds will follow. 